Welcome to the GSI day. And uh, my name is Vitaly, and I'm going to talk about robotics industry, the trends that I see um, in the industry that's going on right now, and about open source um, robotics framework that uh, have been developed over the past 15 years, and uh, how we can build open source technologies collaboratively. And I think robotics has um, really deep roots in the academia and research fields. Um, and there is a lot of learning experience that we can uh, uh, extract from um, robotics industry as a whole. So uh, first I wanted to talk about the robotics industry overall um, and the history of robots. So robots started to appear about um, 50 years ago. Like first use cases were mostly in industrial settings and automotive was the biggest client. Um, robots were doing welding and moving large metal pieces in factories for decades so far. Um, and that was the primary use cases, really. But then uh, autonomous mobile robots started to appear. Those uh, platforms that can move stuff around your warehouse or bring materials and supplies to particular parts of your factory. And uh, probably the most interesting and famous example of this type of company was Kiwi, purchased by Amazon. And uh, that became the foundation for the efficiency for Amazon warehouses. And so um, a lot of warehouses are now using AMRs to improve efficiency of their warehouses. And then around 2016, uh, we started seeing more AI enhanced robots with the um, invention of convolutional neural networks and computer vision so that um, robots can start seeing um, things around them and can, uh, um, for example, pick objects of different shapes and sizes without really complicated training. Um, and so robots could start to be used in e-commerce and like warehouses for uh, really fast deliveries and things like that. And right now, I think that we are in a moment where mobile and service robotics is exploding. Um, last year, service robotics market grew 48%. And uh, we start seeing robots in medical, deliveries, uh, inspections, security use cases. Um, and uh, really, in the next few years, I think we'll st start to see much more robots in our everyday environments. Uh, robots like this, Boston Dynamics robot, is primarily used for inspection. Um, oil and gas facilities use them for detecting leaks from pipes. Electric grid facilities use them to identify overheating of equipment. And uh, the next big trend in robotics that everybody is very excited about are humanoid robots. Humanoid robots are uh, a big uh, trend right now. If many companies have already launched over the past couple of years. And this year, we will start seeing actual pilot deployments of humanoid robots in, in production. Um, there are different debates of whether humanoids would be the dem dominant form factor for robotics. Uh, some say that there will be more humanoid robots, there will be people in the next decade. Um, but there are also opinions that humanoid robots are actually too expensive and custom built robots for specific tasks would always be more cost efficient. Um, but I guess we will find out the answer very soon. And I think that the biggest argument pro humanoid robots is that our world is already created for this form factor. So all the tools, all the machines, everything is already adapted to the humanoid form factor. And that is the biggest argument for uh, humanoid robots to become the dominant robotics framework. And uh, I wanted to um, also say that given that we now start to see more mobile robots and service robots in our world, uh, we start seeing more need for cross-company collaboration. And that is supported by a few factors. Obviously, machine learning have reduced the uh, cost of uh, uh, integrating new robots in your processes dramatically. It used to be that it would cost you as much or even more to integrate the robot in your process uh, compared to the hard cost of the hardware itself. Now, obviously, this cost is going to zero, and uh, it unlocks many use cases for robotics. Robotics hardware becomes cheaper as well. Um, obviously, more form factors appear, and it's much more affordable to get raw motors to build your own robots and uh, complete robots themselves. 
and uh, small and medium enterprises started to feel the need to implement automation. Historically, robotics was primarily installed in enterprise use clients, with enterprise clients. Uh, but now, with uh, technology becoming more affordable and tools are available for people to even train new skills for robots themselves, uh, more and more small and medium companies are starting to implement automation. And that is the first step towards personal robotics, so that we all would be able to train new skills for our robots around house for personal use cases. And uh, now I wanted to talk more about how the robotic software was built over the past decade or so. And uh, it is actually very um, interesting. So first of all, I wanted to ask how many of you have heard of robot operating system, ROS? Hey, some people have heard of ROS. Um, ROS uh, is a robot operating system. and. Uh, it's actually not an operating system. <laughs> it is a, a deployed in Linux, and it is a set of uh, tools and packages that would help you as a roboticist to build your own, your own robot. And it has packages for and integrations with most uh, hardware that exists on the market today with different components, lighters and motors. Um, it has libraries for path planning, navigation planning, simulation, so everything that you may need as a roboticist. Um, is available within ROS, fully open source, so you can use it. And there is almost a million active developers building with ROS at some capacity, at least. And 77% of all robotics companies are using ROS in some way. So it is the major dominant robotics framework. Even if you're using it a little bit, still most robotics companies are exposed to ROS. And uh, ROS was actually started uh, in a private research lab called Willow Garage. Um, it was supported by, it was a private initiative um, and uh, with a goal to fund um, software and uh, hardware for personal robotics. So personal robotics was actually one of the dominant drivers of Velo Garage. The robot was called PR2 uh, that like a lot of people who are working with robotics knew about. Um, but it was a little too early for personal robotics at that time. Uh, but what resulted out of this research was a robot operating system. So teams that were building the software for this personal robot in the lab eventually came out of Willow Garage and started some of the most well-known companies in the industry. And in general, initially, ROS uh, got into academia, so most research labs started to use ROS, and initially, um, enterprise clients were kind of looking down on ROS, thinking that it's like something that students play with. But then, uh, around 2018, AWS released RoboMaker, which was a simulation tool uh, specifically um, adapted to work with ROS. Some other autonomous vehicle companies were exploring ROS for their use cases, and more companies started to pay attention to ROS as a production system. And uh, in the end of 2022, uh, Google acquired a for-profit arm of Open Robotics which is an organization that was maintaining ROS. And uh, um, right now, a lot of people who used to be working on ROS are now employees of Google. And uh, just three months ago, an open source robotics alliance was formed as an organization that was going to continue support for open source ROS. Um, I have to say that I think that the acquisition is uh, generally a good thing even. Uh, I think that uh, Google did a lot to support research in robotics over the years, and just a few weeks ago they did release a new latest version of ROS uh, themselves, so they continue supporting open source. Uh, but I still think that's a great idea that we have an open source robotics alliance, and we need to have much more involvement in open source robotics development because uh, one organization should not be have uh, too much influence over such an important project like that. Um, and so yeah, as I said, some of the most well-known companies in robotics over the past decade were built with ROS. Um, some of them were acquired, others have millions of robots in their fleet already. And now, uh, I think with this change within ROS uh, and uh, new machine learning models that needs to be deployed with hardware need integrations to hardware, uh, we are going to see hundreds of billions worth of value created uh, based on the foundation of ROS. 
um, I think Ross would be the very important framework for creating value in robotics later on in the next decade. And uh, what can we offer as a community to promote open source robotics? So uh, my team has been working with Ross over the past eight years, and uh, we love the project a lot. We funded the Rust implementation of Ross uh, to make sure that Ross could be run on really low cost, low powered systems. Uh, we've recently developed an open source agent that can be deployed on the machines uh, outside of Ross environment though, uh, so that robots could talk to each other over the P2P protocol, um, both locally and uh, over the internet. And uh, we are promoting Web3 services in robotics. So we captured more than 10 terabytes of robotics data on Filecoin so far, and uh, continue to promote a more uh, open and decentralized system within the robotics industry. And uh, right now I see a big opportunity to extend what we are doing with lip 2 p within ROS, specifically because not only ROS is experiencing the organizational changes, it's also experiencing technical changes. So there is a big migration from ROS version one to ROS version two. And uh, last year, uh, we finally had majority of developers migrating to ROS2, so 58% of all developers are now using the second version. And that uh, had some really important uh, uh, new features, like increased robot security, especially as there we now have more production systems, real-time control, and like being able to say that ROS is a real-time system is a big deal for robotics. Uh, but something I'm personally really excited about is that uh, ROS version two is more modular and the communication stack there could be actually swapped and replaced and there are a few alternatives already. Um, um, initially, there are two alternatives based on DDS architecture. Uh, just a few weeks ago with the latest release of ROS, there was a third alternative implemented called Xeno. Uh, but still, most of those uh, um, communication protocols are focused um, on you managing your own fleet uh, in a controlled environment. So really there is a lack of uh, innovation in a space of cross-company collaboration and cross-fleet collaboration. If multiple robots from different vendors need to talk to each other or robots from different companies need to talk to each other. An example could be Sidewalk delivery rovers, those boxes on wheels that are driving around a few cities now, for example, in LA. And there are a few companies that are doing them. And now, when they see each other on the street, they just use computer vision and like hit the brakes and continue driving, hit the brakes, and like it kind of looks uh, a little dumb. <laughs> so those robots could just talk and coordinate with each other and decide who goes first, essentially. And uh, right now, there is no way for them to do so. Like they are just belong to completely different fleets and cannot talk to each other at all. Um, and uh, yeah, now I wanted to show you uh, a little bit of a demo of how our lip 2 p agent is running on my machine. So um, here I'm running one node and the same agent is running on the robot itself, um, accepting the commands. And in this window, I have a, a script running that uh, accepts my keyboard commands and uh, transfers them to commands for the robot. And so this way I can uh, control the robot uh, with just my keyboard. And the commands that I'm sending are sent over lip 2 p as messages to the robot and then it interprets them to move around. Um, also, all the data that is captured by the robot, the logs that are generated by the robot, as well as the uh, video data that are captured by the cameras of the robot are recorded using IPFS local node. So we are generating the hash of all the data that is recorded on the robot, and then we use that to keep track of the data as it moves to your local uh, node, like in, on site, for example, if you have a like construction site where multiple devices back up data to your local node, so that local node will be running IPFS as well, and then backing all the data to the cloud services uh, if that requires to. And uh, as the data moves around different locations, we can keep track of it and make sure that it was not manipulated with by its hash. And uh, 
And uh, right now, I am focused on uh, implementing deeper, uh, leap to p deeper into ROS. Uh, I think that what we've built right now is pretty interesting, but you still need to uh, deploy it separately from ROS environments. By implementing leap to p as complete ROS middleware alternative, like the three that already exist, uh, we can uh, have a communication stack that will be glo offer global accessibility for robotics by its private key, uh, so that no matter which location you come to with your robot, you can discover it by its private key, so you don't have to m struggle with setting up networking interface and new locations all the time. Uh, obviously, P2P can allow communication with heterogeneous fleets, so that robots from different companies or from different vendors can talk to each other and that sets up the first uh, step, that sets up the foundation for implementing more Web3 services within robotics. So uh, decentralized storage, financing of robotics, uh, direct payments in autonomous systems, and much more. Uh, and that also unlocks uh, access to millions of robotics developers who used to be working with ROS before and who are actually requiring more and more cross-company collaboration. And uh, my last question I wanted to ask you, like how many of you have had a thought when I entered the stage, like, oh, this robot looks kind of creepy and maybe scary. Uh, like I have some associations with Black Mirror. Uh, yeah, some of you. Uh, I, I see a lot, I see that a lot. Like come, people have preconceptions of robotics and uh, Unfortunately now, public um, discourse, a lot of conversations are on negative perception of robotics. I am very optimistic about robots. I think that they are here to improve our lives, do the jobs that people actually don't want to be doing. But I see the concern and I understand that it is, it is valid. So I think that there are a few things we can do to make sure that uh, this scenario would actually be technologically impossible. First and foremost, I think we need to be using more secure and sensor-proof communication stack and overall cloud services. Right now, a lot of robots and startups that are building robots are connecting their infrastructure to uh, one of the big cloud providers. And because of a lot of startups are here in California, for example, a lot of them are actually connected to the same data center, which uh, is not ideal, in my opinion. <laughs> um, after talking to Open Source Robotics Alliance leadership, uh, I also see a need to form a broader support to solve issues within ROS. So there are just a limited number of developers who are very knowledgeable in ROS, and, but they don't have enough time to review all the issues that exist in the community. So we need more broader involvement of community to solve issues within ROS. And some of them don't even require you to have deep understanding of robotics per se, like as long as you maybe know some Python, you can solve some issues and just offload some um, um, required job for the team that is reviewing issues right now. And obviously, uh, the governance instruments that uh, surround that are incredibly important, and I think we as a community have done, and like throughout this conference, we've talked a lot about how we can organize systems of support like that. And I think that is something very suitable for ROS uh, as an open source framework. And last but not the least, I think the hardest thing that we could do, but also the most impactful, is to have a physical device built with, as an open hardware with open specifications that could be plugged into the robot. And when it gets the signal from this secure and sensor-proof communication, it can cut power to the motor just on the physical level. And obviously, it's very hard to convince companies to implement something like that. But I actually think there is a business use case that makes a ton of sense and can stimulate uh, implementation of technology like that um, uh, in financing. So actually, the first mention of our smart contracts uh, talked about the use case uh, very similar to what we are describing here. Uh, Nick Zabo, in his 1997 paper, uh, described the way of how you can run a smart contract for car leasing. And if you stop making payments on your lease, the next time you are going to want to use your car, you won't get access to a lock of the car. So very similar concept, I think. If uh, uh, we uh, enable access to DeFi protocols to finance robotics, for example, and they would re be requiring you to install this physical hardware that will be cutting power to the motors and to the robot itself, 
there is a business use case to be said that, uh, well, we can guarantee that the robot would not be doing work that is not paid for. And like, if you're not paying the salary to your robot, it goes on strike. <laughs> um, and that also sets the foundation for uh, solving the dystopian, like, Black Mirror scenarios where we could use the system like that to actually cut the power to the motors physically if something like that happened. Yeah, I do want to end on a positive note and say that I think that uh, robotics scientists are very careful about what they're building. Everybody who I talk to in robotics are very knowledgeable about the risks and are very uh, concerned about them and do a lot to prevent uh, bad scenarios because everybody understands that even one mistake in robotics that we become public may uh, throw the whole industry back like a few years. So most robotic scientists I talk to are very careful about what they're building, and they have really good uh, in intentions in their heart to improve human lives and to uh, require, like to make us live a better life. Thank you so much. <laughs>